the, uh, just introduce myself and why I wanted to discuss this autism epilepsy combination. I'm a pediatric neurologist. I'm an epileptologist. That's how I came into this field of cannabis, because it's almost inescapable if you're a child neurologist, especially if you really focus on epilepsy. But as Dr. Goldstein had mentioned, we, we're seeing now this growing interest in autism. And that's, it's been growing for some time, but it's almost like Groundhog Day. What I experienced going through uh, epilepsy treatment is now, I'm seeing the same thing develop in my patients with autism, meaning that the moms are coming very motivated, very interested in getting off a lot of the medications that have, have led to uh, extreme side effects for many of the kids that we see. And when you think of the uh, different things that we're talking about here, all the various conditions, the two big systems uh, that are being highlighted here are brain and the immune system. Both are systems that evolve over a life cycle, so they're, they're very complex in that sense, and there's huge individual variation within both of those two systems. And so any, any neurologist is going to have to become adept at this, at this area. The, um, I think a lot of, I'll move through these slides pretty quickly because I think this is pretty well known by now, but the latest rates from the CDC are that autism is something that we've seen about one in 59 children now. And if you look at the trend, you know, when you go from the year 2000 to 2014, you're going from numbers in one in 150 to one in 59. This is not going anywhere, and it's, it's a major issue, and it's, it's actually at the point of crisis. It's probably beyond the point of crisis. What I see every day are um, the kids, when, when this epidemic really picked up, a lot of those kids are no longer kids. They're now adults, and they're entering a world where there's nobody to care for them. They don't have, uh, there are no internal medicine docs to care for them. They don't have living situations. They don't have day programs. And the big issues that we're seeing, uh, the, the one at the very bottom is probably the most important, the aggression. So self-injury or aggression towards others has been a major, major challenge. Um, but we have a, a host of issues that, that we face. So uh, common issues include things like anxiety, epilepsy, inflammatory bowel, the pans and pandas world. All these things are, are big issues. Pain is a really underreported concern. Many of the kids I see have chronic headache, chronic abdominal pain. They're not verbal, so it's hard for them to express that. And, and that, too, sometimes comes out through the aggression. But I have to first start by going back to, it was around 2008, and it was a mom who brought this whole idea to me, even before epilepsy really took off. Um, and, and I have to always credit moms for coming up with all the really good ideas. And all <laughs> to the moms out there, you, um, the dad, dads are kind of like a, somewhere between a coin flip and a magic eight ball, I would say. When <laughs> But you know, you ask a mom, and they're they're on the money, and they know really what the right direction is, and their gut instinct is is something you always have to follow, especially in child neurology. And so it was a mom who came to me, and uh, Marie Marie Lee is uh, an author uh, who came to me with her son. She's written editorials to the Washington Post. She wrote a beautiful four-part series for uh, Slate Magazine, online magazine, regarding her experience using cannabis and her son. And what I want to highlight is that this started, I forget the year, the, the first one, I think it was like 2008, 2007, 2008. At that time, it was incredibly brave for her to bring this forward. Uh, she, I mean, there was real fear that Child Protective would be at her door taking her son away. And you can imagine how that would play out. But we, you know, thankfully it didn't go that way. And actually what occurred is he went from a child who was having over 300 aggressive episodes per day um, his teachers were wearing Taekwondo arm pads just to protect themselves. I mean, it was that bad. To basically having multiple days, day after day, with zero aggressions. And he, he went to a school where they would actually keep a clicker and count all the aggressive episodes. And the way she described it two years in was she you know, stated and she was very open about the fact that this is not a cure, but it was a success because now her son, who the, the most severe symptoms were alleviated, and both her, her husband, her son could finally, as a family, heal together. And, and instead of living in a house full of screams and destruction, they could actually be people who are happy uh, as a family unit together. It affected the whole family, and that's an important thing to think about. When, when you have a, a, a child who's going through this, no one in that household uh, is functioning. 
And so it's an important issue, and I, I wanted to just highlight it today. Dr. Goldstein mentioned it, but this is really an epidemic right now. This is a serious, serious concern to the families that I see, and, and I can't see them all because of the number of, of phone calls that we get and the referrals we get. We just can't keep up. Um, there's been a lot of work to describe the prevalence of aggression in autism, and it's really common. So almost 70% will have behaved aggressively towards caregivers, about 50% towards non-caregivers. Um, you don't see it as commonly in kids who have cognitive impairment from other causes. It's actually fairly uncommon in kids with cognitive impairment from other causes. And the reasons for aggression in autism are very different than in other kids. One thing that it's worth noting, I mean, there have been many trials to uh, go through standard pharmacotherapy for autism and aggression, 46 placebo-controlled trials. Of those, the only two FDA-approved products for aggression are both antipsychotics. So it's not, you know, I mean, this is what we have to deal with. So if, if you kind of play it by the book and you go and you're a child neurologist and you go based on what we have available, I could put you on one of two antipsychotics. The problem is, one is they don't work well. I'm just speaking from my own experience. The second is that they, they cause a lot of weight gain. So you just took, a, and I've had many kids like this. I take a kid who weighs 130 pounds who's aggressive. I just made him weigh 230 pounds and aggressive. And you can see where that, where that leads. So um, it's a serious issue. Plus, you have other things like movement disorders, sedation. It's, it's not easy. I even have some kids that the increased appetite on antipsychotics can be so severe that sometimes that itself is a cause of aggression. The kids are so hungry chronically that the, the food becomes their trigger. And you can imagine, again, the families are dealing with uh, massive social isolation. We, um, I just uh, met up with someone I knew in high school who's been living with this. You know, she hasn't been to a movie in 10 years. She hasn't been out to eat. You can't get babysitters. I mean, it's, it's really, it's something you feel like you're trapped sometimes. And one, uh, one mom mentioned in, a, in an article that uh, she describes an unbearable level of exhaustion and almost feeling like she's in jail for life. You know, so obviously we, we need to help these families. Um, in my own practice, one thing I do note, this is something that's much more common in boys than girls. Autism itself is more common in boys than girls, but the aggression in particular is more common in boys. A lot of these boys were the, had the history where they were developing normally up until about 18 months and then suddenly had a regression of developmental milestones. So it's almost like regression begets aggression. So these are kids who, what happens is almost they go through like a second regression in their lives. They get a little testosterone around 12 to 14. They start to go through adolescence. And I don't know if testosterone is the issue here, but um, we're on UCLA campus and we could probably walk by the fraternity row here on a Friday night. And I think we probably could see the effect of testosterone on neurotypical males. And so it, I don't think it's good for my kids who are nonverbal either, but it, I think it's a major factor here. Um, because it's always in adolescence when this develops. And what, one thing that's interesting, and this is where we're gonna go with the autism seizure uh, combination here, is that in kids who have a history of epilepsy, sometimes the aggression kind of precedes it or builds up to it. Um, it's, think of them both as sort of a hyperexcitable state. Their brain is hyperexcitable and it builds from aggression into epilepsy sometimes. A lot of these kids didn't have epilepsy when they were younger. They develop epilepsy sometimes as teenagers. Um, of course, the causes, like in all things, are multifactorial here, though. You have a combination of anxiety, OCD, <clears throat> pain syndromes, sensory integration, communication, list goes on. So for each kid, we have to find out what their individual triggers are. And <clears throat> one, the reason I want to kind of bring up this epilep epilepsy-autism connection is we might, in the end, be treating the same thing here. So we, we know that cannabidiol works very well for epilepsy. Uh, we, you know, I think the, what we're looking at in autism may really be dealing with many of the same mechanisms. The rates of epilepsy in kids with autism are very high, and the, the rates of autism in kids with epilepsy are very high. So, I mean, these two things go together, and don't think of them as comorbid. They, think of it more like when you have a cold, you know, you, you have sniffles, cough, maybe a fever. Those aren't comorbid conditions. Those are all caused by the same cold, right? It's, it's all just different symptoms of the same thing, and that, that's more what the way I'd like to view this. Um, and so when you think of the root causes, and there are many, some disorders might relate to neurotransmitters. An example would be Fragile X, which involves uh, metabotropic glutamate receptor, M-glura-5. 
Um, some issues might relate to growth factors. An example there would be the mTOR pathway. mTOR is a growth regulation pathway. It's also important for certain types of tumors. Um, and that would include things like tuber sclerosis or neurofibromatosis. These are, these are all, all these conditions I'm mentioning can cause both autism and epilepsy together from the same underlying cause. You have channelopathies, Dravet syndrome being a very common one. Um, so that's a sodium channel uh, defect that causes seizures at a very young age and also causes very high rates of autism. Um, and you can have immunologic factors. An example there, an extreme one would be the NMDA receptor antibodies, where antibodies are binding to these excitatory neurotransmitter receptors, and that in turn can cause a whole host of different issues, but in particular seizures. Making it a little more complicated, uh, spike waves on EG might actually play a direct role in terms of language regression or autism features in kids with epilepsy. So th there is an important role here for EG. EG's, I mean, I'm an eg -er by trade. EG doesn't really do a lot, but this is one area where it actually helps, because um, for most of us, it squiggles on a page. But for, when we look at what we have available now in terms of data for autism, uh, there's still not a lot. We, this is an area that is gonna require a lot of growth, and it will, it, this will take off the way epilepsy did. Uh, I, I guarantee you that. So the, um, you know, you, you can look at uh, various preclinical models. For Fragile X, it's actually a little bit mixed. You could see improvements with either blockade or enhancement of endocannabinoid signaling. So the, this, this isn't, these are in rat models, so this, you know, it's hard to know if this translates to humans and which one would translate better. I think it's in interesting that oxytocin, um, which has been long touted as, as potential uh, uh, treatment for improving aggression in patients with autism, Pro, this whole mechanism probably works through the endocannabinoid system, um, at least in mouse models, so that oxytocin may reinforce, you know, oxytocin itself will reinforce um, social bonding. Uh, we think of this as it's the hormone that gets released when people breastfeed or when you uh, see a cute little puppy. Uh, it gives you that warm, fuzzy feeling. Um, and it drives an endamine mobilization. And the, nu the nucleus accumbens is part of the brain that's important for uh, motivated behaviors, things like addiction are actually uh, related to that region. So, so there may be some link in oxytocin. And in Dravet syndrome, what's really interesting is in, in mouse models for Dravet, if you improve the seizures, you actually improve the autism, uh, autistic-like behaviors, as autistic as a mouse can be. But uh, mice do show <laughs> there are ways to, to grade uh, social uh, interaction of mice. And so with improvement of seizures comes improvement in development. And that would be huge if you could actually improve the seizures and improve the core features of autism because many of the seizure treatments we have may sedate you, they may drug you, but they're not gonna fundamentally improve your social development or your language development. So to have that would be a game changer. We're really limited on clinical studies, but this is, gonna, this is where we give a shout out to the nation of Israel for stepping up on, on this, in this area because we haven't been able to do these in the US, so, so I have to acknowledge that. Um, but we had a few case reports, but more recently, uh, coming out of Jerusalem, there, uh, well, there's an ongoing, there is an ongoing prospective study, but this was very exciting when this uh, got published, that uh, looking, at, uh, looking at a total of 60 patients with autism, most, most of them were low functioning, not very verbal, most, mostly boys, um, and they were treated with, uh, it was a 20 to 1 ratio that they were using, so something similar to what we would do for epilepsy. And the dose went pretty high, so it went up to 10 mg per kg per day, and I don't go that high in my patients. Um, most of my patients don't, I don't think to go that high, actually. Often they don't tolerate it at lower doses, but, um, but the behavioral, uh, beha what they saw is those behavioral outbreaks of aggression had improved in 61% of patients. Things like anxiety and communication problems also improved in a good percentage. And you can look at the frequency of the actual disrupted behaviors. So these patients, it's not like the disrupted behaviors fully ended, but in the patients who were having them, the, the frequency per day had dropped. And one thing that was noted is that this is something that was a little bit more evident in boys and a little more evident in kids who didn't fit a specific genetic syndrome. So, so for most kids with autism, we still, most kids still don't have a known gene, uh, despite the fact that we have very advanced genetic testing these days. There, we're only, our hit rate is only about 25%. Most kids don't have a known gene or known syndrome, and those were the kids that seemed to respond well. 
Um, it was noted that there were some sleep disturbances, irritability, loss of appetite. But based on this, uh, the same center is going to launch a prospective double-blind placebo-controlled trial with 120 patients. So that's very exciting. I mean, that's the direction we need to go. Three minutes. Um, in my own observation, I have much smaller numbers, admittedly. But uh, what I could say from what I've seen in about, I have, a, I have a, about 200 patients with autism and aggression that I follow. Again, I'm an epileptologist, but so most of my practice is epilepsy. But about only, only about a tenth of my patients have uh, moved towards cannabis-based therapy. Um, but of those 24, um, and I have a little bit of a higher percentage of girls who've, who've gone uh, towards cannabis-based therapy. But um, what we've seen is the epilepsy, in those who've had epilepsy, I've seen a very high rate of improvement, so, which is great. So of those 24, 17 had epilepsy, 14 of which saw improvement there. Um, and we saw uh, similar improvements in, in those patients, of so the 24 who had aggression as the primary symptom. So keep in mind, aggression is not the only symptom that patients are treating. Sometimes they're treating um, inflammation. They could be treating abdominal pain or, or GI symptoms. So there are other reasons they might pursue this. But of those where aggression was the primary thing, for, uh, for those individuals, the, particularly the non-syndromic boys, about 10 out of 13 for my own practice saw improvement. Um, and of those kids who had a regression, uh, we saw, you know, I'm seeing improvement in about 11 out of 13. So it seems to me if you had to pick the patients that you want to consider this in, the typical patient that, that I think was going to respond well, those who have epilepsy, but the, the story would, be, would kind of follow like this. It's a child who was developing well up until about 18 months, had a period of regression, and then now sometime between about 12 to 14 years of age is suddenly having an increase in aggressive behaviors. And then somewhere around that same time, they're developing epilepsy. And that's a pretty good patient to consider this as a therapy. Um, the one thing to counsel patients on, though, this is not a cure. And they're going to continue to have aggressive episodes, but this will be just one extra tool in your toolbox One minute to help things. Um, and the other thing to note, too, is that what was done in Jerusalem is different from what I'm using or what I'm seeing because their dosing was higher, but the ratio is also different. What I generally find is that patients need ratios when, when you look at CBD to THC, I think they're doing better when you're getting into like a five to one or three to one kind of ratio than that 20 to one ratio. But no two kids are the same, so I, I really can't make any broad assessment. This is a little more, I think Dr. Goldstein emphasized as well, there's a lot of art in this, and you have to, you have to really listen to the feedback that you're getting. And if we look at setting up future studies, we have to acknowledge that there's a lot of heterogeneity within our patients. Um, so we have to look at a lot of various factors to decide what's the right therapy um, and we have to, again, think of what are the specific indications that these patients need help with. The most important thing is our kids need help, and the parents are super motivated. They want to get their kids better. If, if we could set up trials, you'll, you'll recruit like nobody's business. And this is my group <laughs> at the Floating Hospital. We're out of Thank time. You. Thank you very much. Let's hear it for Dr.